In this video, I'm gonna share with you four big changes that I've made to my cycling over the past 12 weeks, which has left me leaner than ever, and I reckon, although you'll be the ultimate judge here, faster than ever on the bike at the age of 41. And I'm a bloke that started my road cycling in my late 20s. Now, before we get into this video, I've got a bit of a warning for you, because if you're a bit like old mate, get to the bloody point, mate. Because these four major aspects to my cycling over the past 12 weeks, they're pretty juicy. There's a bit more meat on the bone, the normal. So I've put some timestamps for you below if you want to jump about, but I need to clarify up front because I've had a lot of questions about this and that is why? What's the bloody point cam? Fast at 41, what's this all about? And many of you rightfully saying, 41 still young, mate. What are you going on about? So in my own little, slightly strange Cam Nichols bubble over the past almost two years, since July 2021, when I turned 40, the age factor, the age excuse has really been ramping up like never before. Oh, you're bloody getting a bit old, aren't you? You're not in your bloody 30s anymore, you dickhead. Not bad for an old boy, eh? And I'm like, what complete, utter, hot steamy bullshit. I completely disagree, particularly when it comes to the sport or activity of road cycling. So over the past three months, I have basically trained my ass off with my training music of choice being System of a Down. Five down, 20 to go. And I've done all this to prove a point. And that point being, it's not about age, it's about commitment, focus and dedication, which I just haven't had for the past few years because I've been focused elsewhere until now. So some of you might be asking, how do I prove this point to you and to me? Thankfully, in road cycling, we have something called power to weight. Now, yes, it's not gonna perfectly delineate raw speed, but it should correlate nicely. In other words, how many watts can I produce on my bike using these power meter pedals divided by my body weight across four key segments. Segment one being five second all out neuromuscular power. Segment two being one minute borderline all out anaerobic power. Segment three being five minute teetering on your aerobic ceiling VO2 max and segment four being 20 minute i.e. the lactate monster being threshold power. Now I've been training with a power meter since 2012 where I purchased a good quality quark based system from my old shop in Melbourne for almost $2,000 they were back then and thus I have 10 years of power history we can look at, we can reflect on and while I don't know my exact body weight for my previous all-time personal best power numbers. I do categorically know that my lowest of the low race weight was 77 kilograms back in the day or 170 pounds. So I've used that body weight to come up with these numbers. And as you can see, they're all from that 2014, 2015 era. Why? That is when I was training and racing with an amateur team in form racing, consistently doing structured training 10 to 12 hours per week with the team. And at that point in time, I was already five to six years in to the sport. So what this is ultimately boiling down to is can I beat my super motivated throffing from the mouth for anything road cycling 33, 34 year old self at the age of 41. And as I mentioned at the start of this video, I reckon I got the job done, but it's not a clean sweep. And there was one power segment that I looked at at the start of this series that I thought was unobtainable. 20 minutes at 381 watts in January 2015 at an A-grade criterium at Glenvale, Melbourne, Victoria, Australia, aka arguably the toughest criterium racing in Australia. In fact, it's quite commonly referred to as the wattage cottage. Now, January, by the way, is the professional off season, so a lot of the pros come back to visit family in Australia. And you can see me here in a breakaway, clearly the most unaerodynamic position you can possibly have rolling turns with a pro from United Healthcare Pro Cycling, Jonathan Clark, a world para champion and Paralympic medalist, Alastair Donahue, and a couple of national road series riders and me, Captain <laughs> Gorilla Arms. And in that race at 34 years of age, in good form, I got pushed to the extreme. I remember that race well. In fact, it's probably the hardest criterium race I have ever done. And that example is a representation of all my previous personal bests, chasing wheels and hanging on for dear life versus this time around, pushing the wind solo, chasing a number on my screen, 
on two back-to-back -back days, where I'd go after the five second sprint and one minute power PBs on day one, and five minute and 20 minute power PBs on day two. Whether I had an advantage back in the day, chasing wheels in extreme racing conditions, or now, did I have the advantage chasing a carrot, that number on a screen, I'll leave that for you to decide. And I'm sure some of you will go down the different power meter rabbit holes. However, it's not so much these power PBs that I feel are the most compelling numbers or data that I can share with you in this video today. It's actually some comparison race data I wanna show you. 34 year old self at the Tour of Bright in Victoria versus 41 year old self at the Tour de Brisbane. And of course, we'll get into that. So the first of four big changes that I made was I got individualized one-on-one -on -one personal coaching. Now, yes, I did have a coach back in that 2014, 2015 era, but it was more of a group team coaching environment. So not overly specific to my individual strengths and weaknesses. And while I am a road cycling coach myself, and I could have coached myself, I wanted that accountability. I wanted to break out of potentially some bad habits that I had, which I've now learned that I did have, and I also wanted to learn something new. So to give you a feel for my starting point before this block of training, this is my training software called Today's Plan. And you can see here is a load chart, which in very simple terms is telling me how much physical stress that I'm putting on my body through cycling training. It's called chronic training load, and it's thus a very beneficial data point for me to understand where I'm at with my current cycling fitness levels. In the months leading into this training, you can see it's kind of all over the place. Looking at this weekly duration data, you can see I'm at 11 and a half hours, five hours, seven hours, five hours, 11 hours, three hours, six hours, leaving me with a chronic training load or CTL score of around 50. Now, without going down a CTL rabbit hole, I know if I'm to be competitive at that sort of club racing A grade level, I need to be around 80 to 90 CTL. And that correlates nicely, typically for me, between 10 to 12 hours of training per week consistently, assuming I'm doing high intensity. So sitting at around 50 or below, if I'm to be taking on myself, clearly I had some work to do, particularly surrounding consistency. But my rule for my coach, who's the head coach of the Road Cycling Academy, Ryan Thomas, was no more than 10 to 12 hours per week. I wanted to create a level playing field with my old 33, 34 year old self. And to be honest with you, between work commitments, family, YouTube content, I simply don't have the time to do anything more. In fact, if you're wondering how I've been able to squeeze in all this training time with all those commitments, I made a video about it up there. So to get the ball rolling, I went out and tested all the four segments at the start of this training process, which you can see here. And to be fair, despite the inconsistency in volume in training, I was still pumping out some pretty decent weeks on the bike before this training block got started. Doing bunch rides and sprinkling in some high intensity interval training work where possible. So it didn't surprise me that I wasn't overly far away from my previous all-time personal best power numbers, albeit I was carrying a bit more weight, and I actually personal best my one minute, asking Coach Ryan as to why this might have been the case. With all that training you've done over the last 10, 15 years, like there's a there's a lot of fitness there, and the muscles remember what to do. That short power you can generally do a really good one-off effort so that one-off real hard effort but repeatability could be an issue so i took off with conviction in fact too much i went to adelaide for the tour down under drank way too many beers and rode almost 22 hours in one week which is emphasized by this big jump in my chronic training load which goes against the principles of progressive overload but it's going to happen from time to time and Obviously I felt it physically, but the benefit of being able to see it visually here in my training software means that I could really respect it, back off and gain a lot from this. So I backed it right off when I got back from Adelaide with rest and recovery rides leading into technically week one of what became a circa 12 to 13 week program in the end. So the big focus of this training program, which didn't have any specific event or race goals in mind. It was more about building general speed and strength on the bike, came in four parts. So the first one was following a personalized periodized plan, which simply means unlike my complete and utter randomness you could see via my load chart earlier, 
Ryan is overloading me in small increments. Using a combination of volume plus intensity, volume being how far is the ride, which for me, Saturday was the main ride we could manipulate from a volume perspective and intensity. How hard is each ride? Is it a cruisy zone two, or am I doing hill repeats, for example? And we could pretty much manipulate all my rides from an intensity perspective. Now, looking back at my load chart, where the actual training plan is, I was much more streamlined and strategic in the upwards trajectory with small jumps week to week and some strategic easier weeks every third to fourth week. Now that easier week could look green, which means I have freshened right up. Sometimes it looks orange, which means I'm kind of in neutral territory. And sometimes it can actually still be red. So still a little bit of fatigue, but the main thing that we wanna see is it go up and come back down. And the purpose of these easier weeks is to absorb the physical stress we put on the body in the sort of two to three weeks, depending on where I'm at in the phase, leading into an easier week. I like to call them an adaptation week where we're absorbing the physical stress. And the easier week doesn't mean we do nothing, doesn't mean we just do zone one or zone two rides all week. What it means is we just back it off. So for example, for me, the harder weeks were 11 to 12 hours with three intense rides and easier weeks were more around the eight to nine hours with one, maybe two hard rides for the week. And let me tell you, without a coach setting my plan, without that accountability, I would think I would have this under control in my head, but I can tell you it would be all over the place like you saw my low chart before and so would my form be all over the place. So that's it at a high level if we narrow in now. The second big thing that I did, and to be honest, I've never really done it this way before, definitely Ryan's influence, and this is progressively working through my zones. With a real focus on sustained efforts in that first six to eight week period now, because I was relatively conditioned before we went into this program, I didn't need to spend a lot of time on zone to aerobic work, meaning we could get straight into an intense block. But if I'm to be honest with you, in the past, when I've been setting myself for an event or for a goal, I would go straight into VO2 max, anaerobic hill repeats that I love doing, big gear threshold efforts, and incorporate some sprints at the track. Neglecting the longer sustained efforts, say around zone three tempo, bottom end zone four, some people call it sweet spot, the type of effort you should be able to do for at least 10 minutes, and then it's gonna to start to bite depending on where you're at in your fitness levels. And I simply wasn't doing that in the past. So a big focus of this program up front was a real emphasis on building the upper end aerobic engine before moving into VO2 max and anaerobic work. There was some upper end work inadvertently incorporated via bunch rides on a weekly basis, but we waited until roughly the eight week mark before bringing that zone five and above work into the program, asking coach Ryan as to why we did it this way. So that work above threshold is really fast acting in the sense that you get really good improvements from it really relatively quickly compared to a zone two training or base training. Yep. So you don't want to do it all the time. So if we do sub threshold, work on your foundation, work on your steady state, you're better able to recover from that high intensity stuff later in the program. Yeah. So building your zone two, zone three comfort, comfort levels, which was an area for weakness for you. So in that first block, we are like, what, what haven't you done before? Where can we improve? And it was pretty much that steady state stuff. So we yeah. needed to work on that. And then we hit stuff that you're good at, quite good at VO2 and it. You see a really good response from that. Yeah. But doing it for eight weeks, can be quite hard on the body. The third big focus Ryan had for me was to exclusively ride in zone two with constant pressure. Now, yes, this is an intense block of training, but if Ryan had me riding at intensity, the five to six days per week, I can train either outdoors or on the trainer. You might as well just dig me a hole and throw me in it. So in order to mitigate overreaching and also to maintain the aerobic engine, you'll see heavily scattered throughout the plan zone two training. And Ryan really emphasized to me, and I'm completely on board with him on this one, constant pressure on the cranks, and also to exclusively, being the prime word here, stay in zone two. Why? Well, there's a couple of big reasons. Reason number one. Or not getting to your lactate threshold or going over it, um, because once you, you, you engage that en those energy systems, 
right? Um, you start producing a lot of lactate, you start producing a lot of what's called a catecholamines and the whole uh, hormonal, right? And metabolic uh, response, it's altered. So it, it might take you a good 30 minutes to go back to basis, to a baseline or 20 minutes, right? Uh, so that you can kind of stabilize again. So it's like a shock to the system. Thanks to GCM for that piece of content. But what Inigo is basically telling me there is if I'm doing a zone two training ride and I keep stepping into threshold territory or above during that zone two session, I'm bringing lactate into the working muscles. There's a chemical reaction and that is disrupting the aerobic fitness adaptations I'm looking to achieve from that workout. The second big thing that's gonna be happening is if I've done an intense session the day before, and this is the base training ride, and I have an intense session the following day, if I'm adding fatigue into this base training session, then I'm gonna carry that fatigue into the next day. And that could leave me in a fatigue state, otherwise known as a performance plateau, as I'm going through this intense block of training, which obviously we don't want. The fourth and final one was to have fun. Now, I feel a big misconception with structured training plans. This was certainly my thought process many years ago is they can and will suck the life out of your cycling. But you will see in my plan, Ryan understood the importance of social cycling for me and left me with the Saturday bunch ride most weekends. And from time to time during this 12 week training block, I chucked a few zone two training rides out the window in order to go be social with friends. Ryan said, provided I'm not overdoing it, I'm not doing it at the wrong time, and I'm being mostly compliant to the plan, we're gonna get the intended outcome. Change number two was off-bike gym work. Now, I've always incorporated one gym session per week into my overall training cycling plan. And that one session per week is designed to maintain strength that I've built up in the gym over the years. But I had gym work all wrong, if I'm to be honest with you. And I identified this in a session I had with cycling-specific strength coach, Aaron Turner, which I'll link up the top here. But the first thing that I was doing wrong was this. Your order of your exercises, we need to front load it more with the, the important cycling stuff. And then the other qualities in the upper body, um, let's put them towards the end. Yeah. Okay. Because okay. they're still important for you, but they're less important for the cycling stuff. Really good for bone mineral density in the upper body. And yeah. if you, heaven forbid, you crash uh, and you have to put your arm out, like we want you strong through here. Right. And we want those bones density less likely to have a major injury. But from performance, if we, if we put them at the start of your gym workout, it's going to increase fatigue. It's going to increase neural fatigue. So then when we get to important lower body stuff or important core stuff later in the session, you're not gonna be able to give us enough out of that. Yeah, okay. And it's called the priority model. There's right. a lot of research on it and it is, whatever you put at the start of your workout while your fatigue levels are low, yeah. that's where you're gonna get your highest strength and muscle growth outcomes. And then the next major adjustment I needed to make was this. It's gonna affect the next day on the bike, definitely, and yeah. possibly even the day after that if we keep training like that. So yeah. what we, we need to do while we're at these higher loads for you, because you're well trained, we're gonna come down we're going to use that same seven rep maximum weight, but we're only going to do four to five reps of it. Oh, okay. okay. And then you're going to do three to four sets on each of those lower body exercises at that weight that I discussed. Yep. And if it's the deadlift, you're going to add the band yes. to it. Okay. I want the variable resistance training on that one yep. as well, because huge strength improvements from that. Now let's talk about your rest periods. This is peak strength training. So you're probably going to want between two and three minutes rest minimum between sets, okay, okay. before you feel ready to go. I know you're used to the circuit style, yeah. but circuit style increases fatigue because you've got low rest. So by front loading my gym routine with leg exercises, not going to failure or close to failure on all exercises and having a lot more rest between sets, the biggest thing I have noticed with this new approach is that I'm no longer getting that delayed onset muscle fatigue. You know those sore muscles you get after a gym session, 24 to 48 hours post session, meaning in the past, if I had to do a high intensity session the day after gym or even two days after the gym, I would often struggle and not be able to get through the session or hit my numbers, which of course would affect my overall cycling training plan and performance on the bike. With this approach, I can literally do a gym session and then the very next day or day after complete a high intensity session and hit my targets without that delayed onset muscle fatigue impacting my strength levels on the bike. Change number three is what I'm calling a nutritional overhaul. Now I've made two big pieces of content on this subject already. Sharing my experiences working with expert sports dietitian, Steph Cronin, which I'll link to below. So we're not gonna deep dive here, but if I was to pinpoint the massive mistake that I was making with my nutrition, with my fueling, I think based off of an old school mentality and a foray into fasting in my mid thirties, 
I basically did all my riding during the week fasted. I didn't even put anything in my water bottles except for water. And then for the longer Saturday ride, the weekend ride where I could go a bit longer, I would fuel in order to not bonk. That was basically my strategy for probably about 10 years. This is what I'm doing now. Strategic fueling in the mornings around those training sessions. So being more aggressive with your carbohydrate intake, really sandwiching particularly your quality sessions with more carbohydrates so that you're burning more fuel during those sessions as well because we've got more energy available to do so or more carbohydrate available to do so. So now before any intense ride, I'll aim for depending on when I wake up and how intense the session is, circa 50 to 100 grams of carbs before heading out. And if it's a really big ride or an event, I'll aim for more like two to three grams of carbs per kilogram of body weight as per the science. I'll link to that study below. And then 60 to 90 grams of carbs per hour on the bike for any intense ride. And then a substantial breakfast, which normally includes a salmon bagel and then a smoothie when I get home. Now, some of you might be rightfully saying, based off of the scientific research in recent times, I should be aiming for more carbs before and during, but keep in mind, I have never done this before and the gut needs to be trained. In fact, the first, I'd say three to five sessions where I was trying to consume before and during, things felt a little strange. It took me a while to get used to it. So I feel like I'm only just getting started with this new fueling strategy. And the three big assets that I've taken away from this, from a cycling perspective, include number one, I feel like I'm consistently training better on a day-to-day -day and a week-to-week -week basis. Number two, I feel like I'm less fatigued in the afternoons after an intense training session. So the recovery is better, which is feeding into the next day and the day after that. So overall, my training has been a lot better. And number three, particularly when it comes to losing the weight, because I'm now front loading or sandwiching my sessions with a lot of carbohydrate, what I have personally found is that I am no longer beasting in the afternoons come that mid-afternoon where I used to snack a lot and I'm no longer filling up my plate multiple times at dinner because I'm not hungry. I don't need to. I've been front-loading my day versus back-loading my day and all this has led to me being leaner than ever at 76 kilos or I think that's 167 pounds and you can check out my skin fold numbers which Steph put together in the video description below. The fourth major change that I made was the length of my cranks by only 7.5 millimeters. Now this is what expert bike fitter Neil Stanbury said a number of weeks ago when I changed these cranks over. I'd be really curious to see if you're, so a flat out one minute effort, the rider's neuromuscular power will taper off and start to become borderline aerobic towards the end. So that the ramp will go like this and then come down like that. Often you'll see with shorter cranks that it will take slightly longer to get to the peak and the peak might be slightly lower in the first five to 10 seconds, but you'll be able to hold the neuromuscular effort for longer. And as you can see here from this data, on my one minute testing ground at the start of this process on the 172.5 millimeter cranks and at the end of this training process on the 165 millimeter cranks as we approach the top of the climb where fatigue is starting to come into play i am able to maintain my cadence levels and power on the 165s which aligns very much to what neil was forecasting yes i was fitter at the end of the process but i still think it's an interesting one to note now the number one reason why neil put me on these cranks wasn't to do with power, is actually to do with position because like many people out there, I suffer from some hip pain while riding, which is caused by hip impingement and the shorter cranks enable me to roll my pelvis further forward, which not only makes me more aerodynamic, but also mitigates hip pain and generally makes me feel more comfortable on the bike. So at the end of my training plan, which was at the start of May this year, I went back to my local testing grounds and completed all four tests again. The only difference in my setup was the cranks, my new Bin Chicken SMP saddle, and some new Bont cycling shoes, which we discussed on the RCA channel recently, the pros and cons with expert bike fitter Neil Stanbury. You can watch that video up there. Everything else was the same on my orange BMC team machine, except my body weight, I was about 2.4 kilograms lighter. And can I tell you, for testing. I have never been so nervous in my entire life, all self-inflicted in my own little YouTube world. So my five second sprint number was 1,081 watts. So out of the four segments, this was the one at 41 I did not get. And not being a sprinter and never going to be a sprinter, this one actually bothered me 
the least. My one minute effort was 700 watts. That's a 60 watt improvement from my previous personal best before this training and a 16 watt improvement from the start of this training, minus the 2.4 kilograms in body weight, of course. The five minute, and this is the one that I personally wanted to get the most because this is a story about personal improvement, self-improvement, and for me, my VO2 max, that's my strength as a rider. And I beat my old self by six watts, being 458 watts for five minutes. Finally was the 20 minutes, and I did this twice, if I'm to be honest with you, because the first time, I didn't get it. I missed it by about eight watts. And the big disadvantage that I had given myself at 41 was the testing protocol, which included a warm up, five minutes all out, 10 minutes recovery, and then the 20 minutes all out. Meaning I'm doing the 20 minute effort on fatigued legs. Now we did it that way because that is the proper way to do the 20 minute FTP test. And we wanted to get an accurate FTP number, particularly at the start of this training process. However, my 34 year old self in that criterion didn't do that criterion on fatigued legs. So eight days later, I went back out and did the 20 minute test on fresh legs on the same territory, which starts with a six minute closed row climb and then undulates with a few left hand intersections, hence the dips in data. And I scored 384 watts. An all time 20 minute power PB at an all time low body weight, but it's actually some old versus new race data that I wanna pull up and show you here because this is where the four critical changes that I've made to my cycling over the past 12 weeks have really come into play. This is stage two of the Tour of Bright in 2015, Tawonga Gap stage. And this is some recent race data from the Tour de Brisbane in April 2023. Both are road races of about two and a half hours to three hours in length. Both I was in a breakaway during the race at around the same average wattage, although the recent Tour to Brisbane, I was in the break for 30 minutes longer, and both had hard finishes, including hills. In terms of weather, I don't really recall that being a factor on either day, so a pretty fair comparison. And for me, this is where the learnings and effort over the past 12 weeks have all come together. The structured personalized training, the higher strength resources from gym work, the fueling strategy I changed, and possibly the shorter cranks contributing to a better position on the bike. It all shined in the final parts of the Tour de Brisbane in 2023. At the Tour of Bright in 2015, you can see I'm riding in a bunch for about an hour leading into the final hill. This is after being in a break for 45 minutes during the race. Granted, the hill is just over 20 minutes in length, so it's longer than the Tour de Brisbane Hill at the end, but as you can see, I am Captain Fadeaway, struggling to keep my power at or around that green dotted line being threshold. In fact, I'm falling into my tempo zone. I can't even maintain threshold. And trust me, I was pushing it in this event. This was the A priority event for the year for the Inform Racing team. And this scenario that I described, this Captain Fadeaway, was so very common back in the day. The Tour de Brisbane in 2023, on the other hand, I ride into the hill in a breakaway. So I've been at or around threshold for over an hour. I can then sustain a VO2 max effort at circa 380 watts for over eight minutes at over two hours deep into the race. Then after coming down the hill, I can swap turns at around threshold and VO2 max to finish off. So while the point of the series was to get a lot faster and stronger on the bike, I feel ultimately I've just become a lot smarter. If you've gotten value from this video or the series, please don't forget to give the video a like down below. It helps the channel out. And while you're down there, you might like to check out a six and a half thousand word blog article I wrote about this entire experience. For now, time to move on to the next project and I'll catch you in the next video.